First thing in the morning on a Tuesday. Feels like Monday. I don't know what today is. Well, it's Wednesday if you're listening to this right as it comes out. So, I successfully predicted this will come out tomorrow. Unless you're listening to it on a future Wednesday. Or any other day of the week. And of course, all this is Babel. But that's okay. I like to start the show off with a little Babel. Especially when it's first thing in the morning on a Tuesday. And it actually feels like Monday. And that's okay. Don't worry, I don't babble on the podcast. This was done at an appropriate hour where I had full function of my brain and felt great. And I got to interview a guy that I've had on my radar for some time. His name is Zach Hansen. I actually have a short list of people uh, from a group that I'm in of awesome people that all come from different walks of life that have all decided to study and entertain the idea of homesteading and uh, survival skills and, you know, different things of that nature. You've got to be careful with the words you use these days. Uh, <laughs> if you follow Mike Glover, who wrote the book Prepared, uh, he became on the FBI's watch list for teaching Americans how to defend themselves and and teaching them how to can food and other activities like that. So hey, you want to be mindful of the folks that are, you know, red flagging shit, the AI that's red flagging shit. There's plenty of that still. Uh, don't think because you can talk about COVID-19 on Twitter that that has gone gone to the wayside via the, the massive uh, stream of MSM, which is now, you know, and has been YouTube mainstream media, Google mainstream media, all that shit. So uh, I have no doubt that, that there are certain topics you could say on a podcast that would have somebody showing up at your door. So anyway, Zach Canson, great guy. Somebody I've looked up to, he was a tech nerd. And I mean that in the fucking highest regard. It's funny because as a, as a former jock, um, I actually had a lot of nerd friends. I went to Monta Vista High School, 70% Asian and Indian population there. When I was there, it's like 90 now. Um, we didn't do too well in football. That's, that's not a joke. That's actually true. Now, you might be able to do the math on that and say, yeah, 70% Asian and Indian. You weren't going to do well at football, but we didn't do well at football. We were 0-10 my freshman year. We did very well scholastically, and believe it or not, national champions in badminton, like fucking 10 years straight. So if you go to Monta Vista High School, you look in the rafters. Badminton, we got it on lock. Football, not so much. But as I stated earlier about nerds, I had a lot of highly intelligent people that I would consider nerds that, were, that I was close to. And I always looked up to them. I admired them, even as a jock. And of course, they admired me as a jock. But I admired them because they were book smart. They could handle the shit that I couldn't. They could do, they could see through the pages of the things that I was like, what the fuck is this? Why are we doing this? They got it. And Zach was very successful in tech. He did a lot of cool shit and, and slowly began to peel back the layers of, I'm not sure this is for me. I'm not sure this is what I'm destined to do. I'm not sure this is the right move. Since then, he's become an author. He's done a whole host of cool shit. He actually went one step further than me. I mean, I'm homesteading down in Lockhart. 30 minutes from Austin. I'm not that far off the beaten path. Uh, and he, he moved way out in the cuts in Idaho. Uh, found his wife on his second leg. All sorts of cool shit. He has a fantastic story. He's a dad. He's homesteading. More importantly than that, he's doing a lot of cool shit that I think everyone here will be into. We had a very similar trajectory uh, when it came to getting into hunting. I think right around the same time that Rogan and was having meat eater guys and all the homies on the podcast, John Dudley, that kind of stuff. So... It's been cool to get to catch up with him, with Zach, and get to know him better. He's a fantastic dude. He'll be back on this podcast again. And, and the reason I mentioned that group is because there are some fucking awesome people in there. I'm not going to name them all by name. Uh, some have already been on the podcast, and some more will be coming on in the future. I just did a podcast with Dr. Bart on his podcast. I'll release that here in the show notes when it comes out. Um, but you can expect him. He's going to be on this podcast as well. Just a fucking awesome dude out of Florida doing some really cool shit. So I'm excited that I have a little, it's like a, it's like a side revenue stream. You know, I don't think of the podcast as revenue, but I think of the content is the content stream, right? I got a fucking really good little side piece here. That's going to deliver me some awesome fucking people that not too many people know about. So, and without further ado, my brother, Zach Hansen. Got our audio check. Zach Hansen. How are you, brother? Good, man. I'm feeling good this morning. I actually just came out of a coaching session which is something relatively new for me. I have a uh, an ex Coinbase executive, ex LinkedIn executive who's doing professional coaching now. Um, I met him in 
Nicaragua, actually, earlier this year. And we've been working together. And he's kind of getting me out of some of the funk that I've been in around the mentality I grew up with, which is suffer well, which is not necessarily a bad thing, um, but kind of starting to get through that acceptance plateau of where I'm at now, being good with that and recognizing that I don't have to suffer to achieve good things uh, necessarily. So feeling good coming out of that, doing a lot of meditation the last hour. That's awesome. Well, you mo- you're probably beaming then after the, I, that's like, when I first got into meditation, it actually was plant medicines that continued to kind of gently push me in that direction. And then not so gently like, Hey, we're not going to give you any, anything else, anything new until you actually start the practice. But, um, it was still years before I really got it. I was kind of like hit and miss and I'd, I'd get into meditation and I'd kind of get it every now and then, but I had no real recipe for how do I, how do I enter into that space again and again and again. And then I met a lady named Emily Fletcher who I've had on the podcast and she has a, a phenomenal um, course called Ziva Meditation, which is one of the Vedic teachings from 6,000 years ago and, and uh, just fucking brilliant, man. It's a mantra based and like, since I've gotten a hold of that, it's like, it's 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 a mandatory part of every day because it it works. It's my reset. It's a it's a it's a way to zero out and just clear the cobwebs. So that's really cool. How'd you you met this guy in Nicaragua? What were you doing out there? Uh, ironically, it was a bachelor party. So I'm actually officiating. Uh oh, my best friend for a long time. Met him in jujitsu 15 years ago, um, and we've been best friends ever since. Business partners a whole lot, and he's getting married. And he's asked me to officiate the wedding, which is going to happen a little later this year. But he had a bachelor party. And we we surfed together all the time back in the day. So we went down to Nicaragua. And he is friends with this guy. So this bachelor party, yeah, I, I liken it more to like a Tony Robbins seminar. It's all a bunch of athletes. So it was like we were all just surfing on the beach. Not a whole lot of drinking. It was just more of like this... Uh, you know, building each other up and challenging each other, you know, saying, man, you're not doing that right. You're not doing this hard enough in your life. So <laughs> it, it came out really good, but I met him there um, is the answer to your question. That's super cool. Yeah, that's, that's, that's <laughs> I, I haven't had a bachelor party like that yet. It's mostly like um, a lot of my old homies I grew up with, you know, are still playing fantasy football and getting hammered each weekend or, uh, you know, old ASU football buddies that are still doing some of the the not so beneficial drugs and mind altering substances. So, yeah, I've, I've uh, I still have a good great time with them every time I get to hang out. But it's it's a little different these days for sure on my end. Let's talk about life growing up. I normally start with like what what made you into the person you are today. Talk about life growing up. Um, you have a pretty dope bio, you know, and um and 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 obviously we'll dive into you know how we know each other now, but um. I love, I love seeing this trajectory, you know, cause I think so many of us are on this path where it's like, I mean, I started homesteading two years ago and it was like, you know, we got, we're going to, yeah, I got a few guys, we're going to go to, does anybody have farm experience? My wife did. That's it. She's the only fucking one of us that had any farm experience prior. So it's, it's cool to see people that are digging a deep dive into stuff that maybe came from a totally different trajectory. Talk about that trajectory and, uh, and just life in general and what kind of led you to this path. Yeah, it's roundabout as best as I can describe it, meaning I grew up very much middle class USA in Georgia. We lived in a suburban area and my family were hunters, farmers. I just didn't come from that lineage at all. Um, It was very much where I grew up in the era of kind of bucking any sort of trade education. It was like, hey, no matter what you do, you're going to go to college, you're going to get an education, doctor, lawyer, whatever the case may be. And I was kind of on that path a little bit, but the frank point was, is I was a, a pussy as a kid. Uh, I just was you know, not a very strong or outgoing child. Um, anything kind of scared me. I was afraid of thunderstorms for the longest time, you know, like a lot of kids are. Um, so I wasn't really pushed a lot. And ultimately I got to high school and you have know, started getting bullied, things like that. And I was like, man, this really sucks. Like, I'm not like a, a, a small guy per se. I'm definitely not a huge guy, but I was like, how do I fix this? And that point in my life where I got beat up over some chick um, and the guy who beat me up was a wrestler and mm-hmm. he just double legged me. 
and, you know, hit me a few times and I was just kind of covered up. I'm like, Man, this sucks. Like, yeah, I wasn't crying. I wasn't in a lot of pain, but I was just like, that is the worst feeling in the world. And I ended up befriending the guy and I was like, well, where did you learn all this? He's like, just come wrestle, dude. So I, I started wrestling and I kind of put that as a real trajectory switch in my life was just learning grit and resilience and doing that in a wrestling room for a long time. And then eventually jujitsu and everything else like that. But, you know, that put me on a path where I eventually married a woman who was an FBI special agent. She was a world champion in jujitsu and master's class. And we were just doing jujitsu all the time. And eventually that got to the point where we were just optimizing everything in our life to make the long story short. And eventually it got to food. And obviously we were buying beef at the store, doing everything else. And, uh, you know, we were looking for an edge everywhere. And I was like, well, what about hunting? It was about the time uh, a lot of the influencers in the space were really getting into bow hunting. And that was really kind of the, the trigger point for me to make a very long story very short. That's so rad though. And I mean, yeah, that's so super resonant. I had, you know, I was pushed in football. And so I kind of ironed out like uh, my, my head coach used to call call us puppies. He'd be like, oh, he's still a puppy. You know, if he had any pussy in him, he was just a puppy. Like he'll grow out of that, but he's a puppy. And um, and that, even though it pissed me off when he'd say it, like I totally get that now having kids. Like, oh, he's just a puppy. Don't worry, he's gonna grow out of that on his own. But wrestling specifically is something that that will will apply enough pressure to where you don't have a choice but to push yourself beyond whatever glass ceiling you have there. You're going to break through that over and over again. And I think it's a real gift for kids. You know, it's it's kind of a bummer now that we're in Texas. There's not there's not a huge draw for wrestling here. So thankfully, you know, I got the kids in jujitsu and they have some great coaches and they practice different wrestling elements. Um I was talking with Daniel Cormier, who runs summer camps. And I'm like, look, I want to bring like half of our gym out next year. We'll get an Airbnb out in Gilroy and just you know, attend the whole thing, you know, and just shift them, you know, so that they get at least like a, an intensive with that. But that's so cool. And it is, it is you know, like for all the, sh- the, the shit talking around bullying and fighting and things like that, like, yeah, if it's, if it's some pest online that's just constantly taking you down, that's one thing. But to actually have a physical altercation which oftentimes does bring you guys together, right? In a weird fucking way, you know, that, that guy becomes a buddy. It's, uh, I don't know if you've read, you probably have read these, but uh, if you haven't, they're great when your kids get old enough for the Way of the Warrior Kids series by Jocko Willink. Yep. They're awesome. And it covers bullying. It covers all sorts of shit, you know, and it covers like, what is, how does that other kid grow up? You know, all, all sorts of things that most people don't think about. But uh, yeah, there's so much good stuff there. And that's that's super cool that you, you know, get into jujitsu. Where are you at now with uh, with jujitsu? I well, jujitsu. It's been a lifelong passion. So I'm actually we're lucky. So there's a little bit of foreshadowing, but we live at a cabin at the end of an 80 mile dirt road in Atlanta, Idaho, which is the most rural uh, place in the lower 48 that's accessible by road. So training is a little more hit and miss. Like I'm actually in Boise at the moment. We have a home in Boise now too that we have some kids and. You know, we have to have a place we can go to if we need to get to doctors, appointments and stuff. And we have a great gym. There's actually an Alliance affiliate with Gigi Pavia, who is one of the co-founders of Alliance with Jacare here in Boise, of all places. Um, so, you know, we have great team here. So when I'm like, actually after this podcast, I'll be going to the gym. So, you know. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's great to be able to train and get that in. But since our full kind of off-grid lifestyle that happened about four years ago, you know, training has taken a backseat, which is a bummer, but it was kind of one of those necessary evils. However, I've gotten two other jujitsu guys to buy property up there. So we're going to probably buy a Connex or something similar to you, throw some mats in it so we can be a little bit more regular. Yeah, that's, that's all you need. I mean, we're building out a house right now on the land and it just, I mean, it, we were talking about, we got like a, you know, my garage I, I in our house right now, I just overstacked. There's an ice bath, there's a sauna, there's overhead storage, there's fucking, there's a heavy bag, there's all the Concept 2 gear. Like you can't fucking walk through there. There's like one little strip where you could do kettlebell swings, you know, but it's just way too much. So the next one, I'm like, nothing's going in there. We'll have one row overhead where I'll hang a couple of heavy bags, but the whole thing's going to get, you know, the pro job from Fuji mm-hmm. where you got the springboards, you know, the whole deal, just like the Olympic training center. So you throw your kids around without worrying about them breaking their neck then, right? Exactly, exactly. Toss their ass around. But um, 
I'm so looking forward to that because the kids are into it and there's uh, other homeschooled kids that are all at the same gym, you know? So there, there's like a small group of kids that are all around the same age. They're, they're getting a place to lock hard as well. And then all the adults as well. Like as long as you got people to get on the mat with, that's awesome. Cause even teaching, like I'm teaching the, um, the kids classes, like teaching is such a refresher to ingrain the fundamentals and the basics. It's such an awesome component you know, the sport. And I think that as long as you've got a touch point where you can at least get on the mats with a few people, like there's a lot to be gained in those experiences for sure. Yeah. And we're, we're kind of a little bit behind you guys. Like our kids are two and it'll be a year next week. So we have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. Oh, uh, so, cool. so, you know, my daughter is now just in that phase where she sees mommy and daddy working out every day and she'll come over and hang from the rings or do her squats or, you know, say, Hey mom, dad, can we go work out now? So the next phase will be you know, she starts by drag her to jujitsu with me when I'm here and getting her curious. But yeah, we're excited about that phase coming along as we start to really think about schooling and how we want to handle that. And, you know, I'm looking up to you and other folks that you and I both know, trying to figure out what that might actually look like in such a rural environment. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the Dr. Thomas Cowan was a massive influence on me, you know, act for years actually is one of the best. He wrote one of the best like natural remedy books for childhood illnesses with um, Sally Fallon Morell, the head of the Weston A. Price Institute, the the Nourishing Traditions Book of Child and Baby Care. So I've been following him for years, had him on the podcast and he talked about Ivan Illich in the book Deschooling Society, which was just like mind blower, you know, now unschooling is the thing, not even homeschooling, but really unschooling. He kept correcting me on that. Um, so much to be gained from allowing our kids the space and freedom to do what they want. And then when they really start tracking what it is they're interested in, they'll, they'll accelerate beyond their peers. He had a, a N equals four experiment where a Waldorf teacher had left. She started schooling for uh, four kids between the ages of 10 and 12. None of them could read or write at 10 and 12, completely unschooled. And they all had a deep desire at this point to learn. Within two years, they were taking college level courses in the things they had an interest in and could read and write fluently, you know, every other minimum they had surpassed their peers as well. So I find that to be incredibly interesting. And, and it's, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's a one small, small piece, but coming from, um, just coming from my background where I never really had a, a huge draw and, and there was, a, you know, I did school cause I had to, there was nothing that excited me about it. And then only in the secondary career of fighting did I actually start to appreciate education where I needed to learn things and I could apply them where I was like, damn, this is cool. Learning's cool. Never thought that growing up, never thought in college. So I think just giving them that gift and obviously, you know, we speak so much in that group about the, the, the gift of, of learning how to think for yourself, you know, <laughs> and, and not, not what to think, but how to think. I think those are, those are super critical as well, but you got time. That's what I'm getting at. You got plenty of time to figure it out and see what's going to be right for you guys. And there's pros and cons to all of it, but um, it is nice being able to take off the, this is what we're supposed to do type shit, you know, with anything there is, you know, I think that's one thing that COVID really just burst the bubble of all like, this is what you do in society. It's like, oh, this shit is fickle. <laughs> like this could end in a heartbeat. Like let's do what we want to do and, and just try it out and experiment. So and that's working. super cool. Yeah, you know, we're up, And like you said, there's a lot of time, but time goes by pretty damn quickly. But it is interesting, to, and we'll talk about this in a bit, I'm sure. But you know, where we're at, even with our two year old, you know, the joke about her being feral is fun with my wife and I, but we can't keep her indoors, right? It's she wants to be outside with a stick more than a doll and fixing trees or chasing squirrels or, you know, looking at a moose or an elk or something outside. And, you know, I ask her every morning and this could just be her uh, repeating things that I say, but I'm like, what did you dream about? And she's like, oh, I dreamt about deer last night. It's always an animal. And I'm like, what'd you do with a deer? She said, well, there was a mama deer, a baby deer. And you know, that might be me projecting some of the things that I want her to take on, but it's just interesting. Cause then when we come to the city, I ask her the same things that it's, it's different. She's not dreaming about animals the more, you know, when we're out in the woods. And I find that interesting. I don't know if there's any, you know, real meaning to that or not, but I'm excited to see and give the kids that opportunity to really explore, like you said, things that they enjoy or are at least naturally drawn to. And for the kids, like my daughter would rather play in a mud puddle than, 
anything else. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong with that either. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, you, you're an author, um, entrepreneur. Talk about your business career, you know, and that as well, just kind of leading you back out uh, out of out of the the common you know a common machine and into the wild. I think this is awesome. Yeah, I was a cog, man. I was a cog. I uh, talk about that idea of suffering well. You know, I grew up, like I said, bucking trades, which I'm trying to make up for later in life. Like you know, relearning the well, do these different things that matter, especially where we're at, kind of homesteading a little bit more. Um, but it was go to college, do this, and succeed. It was. I was a 90s baby. So, I mean, I was born in the 80s, really grew up in the 90s. And it was, you know, an era of wealth and, you know, excess for the most part. So it was, if you go to college, you'll come out, you'll make a six-figure job, you'll get your white picket fence, everything else like that. So I followed that path um, with a little bit of deviation. And ultimately, I got out of college, didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went overseas. I worked partly for the Department of State and partly just for NGOs and teaching English all over the world. So I lived in Russia, Kyrgyzstan, the Republic of Georgia, getting my ass kicked by wrestlers all along the way, which I can uh, attest that being the sole American in a Russian or USSR wrestling gym is like the worst thing in the world. You're just <laughs> ultimate uh, punching bag. Uh, ultimately, Vienna and then Saudi Arabia. So just really ran the gamut on uh, experience there. But you know, I got the bug while traveling that I actually wanted to make money. And I didn't know what I wanted money for. You know, at the time I was like, oh, cool. You know, I'd love to be able to have the white picket fence, big house, all of that. Um, so I followed that path hard. I started a company that failed. And then after that company failed in the technology space, I went into industry, into technology. So I ended up going to IBM and ultimately weaseled my way somehow into working in IBM Watson kind of at its inception with machine learning and AI. And then since then, I've just been on a, a really a decades long trajectory of working in some capacity or, or the other in artificial intelligence. Um, had some large companies, banking institutions to some of the biggest video streaming companies in the world, just building algorithms that draw your attention to a screen, uh, which is yeah, there's a little bit of guilt there too, because it's a little bit don't get high on your own supply, but I've been building all these things that garner attention. Like how do you build and monetize ads on a video network better? You know, how do I get Kyle Kingsbury who's watching, you know, some streaming show to click on this ad and then convert, right? So it's all about data and those kinds of things. And it's a real dichotomy because as I started to get more hunt curious and off grid curious, I really started to see the detrimental effects of a lot of the stuff that we had been building over the last 10, 12 years. And it was almost more of the real push to say, I need to find a balance. And the only way I can find a balance when I'm working with some of this technology every single day is to be so far off grid that when I close my laptop, I have no cell signal. Um, so that was the trajectory of it. Yeah, that's that's damn incredible. I think that for for people that that don't necessarily have access, you know, you think about that. There, there was. I remember when I was at on it, and I've told this story a number of times on this podcast. But it is, it is, it does fucking crack me up because this is this is how modern mo the modern world is. There was a study in Japan, uh, and I think they called it reforesting, where where they studied depression, and if you went for a thirty minute walk three times a week in nature. That had like a 60% drop in all cause depression. Whereas if you did it, you know, in the city, it, it had a much lesser effect, but it still had a positive effect because you're going for a walk and you're outside. And, you know, they're talking about um, plant pheromones and all this and how the way nature's intelligence speaks to us and interacts with our bodies, the immune system, all this stuff. But it's just like, that's how far removed we are that you got to re reforest or earthing, grounding. You take your fucking shoes off in the grass and it's like, yeah. <laughs> what? Of course, of yeah. course. Um, but it is such a, it's such a phenomenal remedy. And I find even walking around, you know, like we, our house right now is in, is in the suburbs in Austin. Um, even just walking around here, you know, there's all these new trees. Every house got planted with two oaks and a couple of them, you know, there's crepe myrtles and different flowering trees that some people, you know, it's, it's, it's through the curveball and, and planted those. We've got a cotton one in front of our house. that's massive. And like, 
year after year, we've been here for three years. Like you watch these things grow. It's like watching kids grow, you know, and even long before we, we, um, started putting trees in the ground at the homestead, you know, this was like a way to track and watch nature and see the different birds coming through and things like that. And like, that is such a positive effect on me. Even if I'm doing 10 minute walks, 15, 20, 30 minute walks, like it's just like, a, ah, there we go. That's what I need. And to move in it, you know, to move in nature and then sit in nature, you know? So I, I totally get that. It speaks volumes. Um, talk a bit about, you know, your, your first book on AI, you know, the, the fake it till you make it style, yeah. Um, really, you know, helping, I got, we got a lot of millennial listeners and I know that was geared towards millennials. Talk a bit about the, the premise of that and, and really what you expand on in that book. You know, it, it's, hindsight's always an interesting thing. You know, I, that was the first book I ever wrote and it was kind of on a whim. I knew I'd always wanted to write. I've always enjoyed journaling. I, every time I was overseas, I always journaled. So I just have stacks of journals and as a kid, I always loved books. And growing up, I loved books. And my grandfather, again, not a hunter, not a, you know, outdoorsman per se, but relatively successful guy from a career perspective. And growing up, he's like, Zach, if you ever want to learn anything, get a book. And he made me a promise then, which was, if you ever want a book that is to further your education in any capacity, you know, it could be about holistic plant medicine or anything, he would buy it for me. And he stuck to that. And I took full advantage of it. So I had one, you know, button that I could press essentially with my grandfather to get a book. So, you know, whether it was, you know, wrestling tactics, which I took advantage of, you know, buying those old books from like, you know, Dan Gable books, things like that, all the way to the other end of the spectrum of, you know, Buddhism books. I'd buy them and I'd read them. So I always had this love affair with books. I was like, you know what? I'm in my mid twenties. You know, I thought I knew everything. I'd had like a relatively successful beginning in my career. I still hadn't been into hunting. I still hadn't thought about living off the land, but I was achieving the things that I was told I was supposed to achieve. You know, the white picket fence, get a house, get a car payment, all that stuff. And I was like, well, this is success. And I have a lot of friends who still haven't achieved that. So I kind of want to write a book. And it was all about mentorship, grit, resilience, all the kind of normal tropes. So it's not something, you know, if you go back as a millennial, you can read it and hopefully glean something from it. But, you know, looking back, it was a little bit premature, right? It was one of those things where I hadn't really started to be tested. I thought I had been, um, and maybe I had comparatively, but, you know, it, it was a book that was more of ego driven of just, Hey, I need to write a book. I wanted to write a book. I know I have the capacity to and get it out the door. Um, the follow on books are the ones where I feel like I've had a lot more lessons and, you know, information to give that is more valuable, but that's where that one originated from was just that I achieved all these things. Everybody was telling me to achieve. Here's a formula to follow if you want to do the same thing. And it was only later that I realized I never really wanted that in the first place. (laughs) <laughs> that's probably the most fucking honest answer I've ever heard an author on the, on his own book review ever, <laughs> like not just on my podcast, but, but period. So I appreciate that. Um, talk about how life started to shift and, you know, you get into hunting. I, I think the same thing happened to me, you know, I was listening to Rogan's and obviously was a fan of his from, from my MMA career, but he's such a great podcast, you know, and you see like the mediator guys and, uh, John Dudley was sponsored by Onnit, you know, when I was there running the Onnit podcast. I'm like, let's get fly fucking Dudley in. And he's always coming to Houston for a, a, a charity event for Hurricane Harvey. And then he's going to be in Austin at, um, at Archery Country, you know, this really cool uh, archery spot down in Austin. And I was like, fuck yeah, man, I want to meet him. And I podcasted with him and he ended up building me my first bow and giving it to me. It happened to me my birthday. And like, that was like, that's like fucking Lance Armstrong building you a bike, you know, and handing it over to you. I was just like, damn, dude. So that got me into archery. And it's funny, really, that was probably in 20, that was 2018. And um, really took bow hunting seriously, practiced a lot. And then when 2020 happened, I kind of did the opposite. Most people get so good with the with the rifle, they're like, this is boring. Let me go to the bow. And I love the bow, but but seeing 2020 and all the shit in the world, I was like, it's got to be, I, I, I kind of like the idea of uh, being able to shoot something at a mile. I kind of like the idea of just having a little bit more uh, protection up my sleeve, you know, for 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 anything that may arise in the world. So that's what, what really, you know, was the transition for me heading that direction. But yeah, the influence of that, the the really the, the bringing up, you know, the rekindling of the hunting space, my 
all my relatives hunted. My dad's the oldest of five. He's got two brothers. I'd go with them on hunting trips when I was a kid and then football and then fighting and just never had time for it. So really got, got into it in the last like five years. And it is something like the moment you get into it, you realize there's something here and there's something here that's been missing that I can't get anywhere else. You know, like Aubrey's, Aubrey's talked with me a lot about fighting. Like there's something I can't get doing another thing. You see this with, you know, guys like Andy Stump and different, different high level, um, military folks, when they come out, you know, they, they can't get the thing they had. So they're looking for something else that's kind of close. And I feel like hunting is one of those primal things where like you only get it there, you know, and, and, and there's a benefit to, you know, shooting arrows at a target and just getting in the Zen moment. But it's still, you know, like when you've got an animal in front of you, it's a whole different fucking thing. Yeah. Uh, well, I, it sounds like you and I started about the same time then. It was about 2018 that I, um, did not have John Dudley build me a, a bow, but instead got a hand-me-down Matthews from a friend that was, you know, about an inch too short on the draw length, but, you know, I hadn't knew no better and just kind of worked with it. But, you know, you're right. It, it is, it's almost like that grounding. It's almost, when you get into it, it's like, duh, this was here this whole time. Why was I not taking advantage of it? What was the, blockers to keep me from understanding that this is just kind of a natural space and natural tendency to, you know, be into. And, you know, once you open Pandora's box on that, it's really hard to pull back, right? It's, it's this natural thing. Like you, you might've got into it from influencers just like I did. And you might be like, okay, this will be like a fun little hobby. But second you pull that string back or, you know, you start to, you know, use your six by cream more and you put a, around in the chamber and close it and you look down that scope, you know, 500 yards down range, you hear the clinking of that steel. There's something deeper to it than just the surface. Hey, I want to go kill an animal. Right. And, and that's what that journey really starts to open up. And I don't think many people come back out of it. Right. So like you said, fighting, you know, 15 years on, I'm still dragging myself to the gym and it's something primal about, you know, either, being choked or getting to choke somebody. And it's, it, it taps into something primal, I think. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I've had, I've had longer stretches than I wanted uh, after getting my black belt where I wasn't, wasn't training often, you know, I'd get hurt with an inside heel hook and doing no gi and fucking take me out for eight months or a year. And, um, you know, with stem cells, just a fucking shit injury, you know, and I'm kicking myself in the ass for the injury, that kind of thing. And so I'd take more time off, but we finally got a good jujitsu gym and we found a really good boxing gym, well, Black Sheep Boxing, where we'll head in just for once a week and we'll do a lot of drills, a lot of Tabata stuff. John Hackleman taught me, Chuck Liddell's old coach, and then and then we'll spar light. But like seeing he's seeing a fist come out your fucking face, like there's nothing you get at 24 hour fitness that remotely compares to that. There's no trail run. Trail run's dope. Yeah. There's no trail run where you got to, def- you know, fucking where you have a fist flying in your face or where someone's trying to rip your arm off. You know, like those are, those are categories that can only be reached in and of themselves. You can't get that anywhere else. And I think that that is, if you boil it down as consequences, right? And for me, I was always fabricating consequences, maybe subconsciously. Like I sought out wrestling and then it was jujitsu. And I'm surprised we didn't overlap because I was at the 10th Planet gym there when the old Onnit or the old Onnit gym um for quite a while before they moved across the street. I don't know where they're at now, but this was like 2015 or something. Yeah, they're right, right across the street. That was two years before I got here. I got here in 2017. Okay, so I was there right before you, but we were there um, for quite a while. And then, uh, but it was always manufactured. I'd go on these long ultra endurance runs. It was like, there was some need inside of me to constantly suffer well. Getting back to that point, I always felt like I had to suffer to get you know, some type of good. And then as the hunting space came up and, you know, just to paint a little more color is my ex-wife and I, we had the white picket fence. We had a a luxury home. We were, you know, had all the bills covered. It was great to a certain degree. Um, But I started getting just turned off to all of that, you know, as I started getting more into hunting. And part of it too was also my ex-wife's job. She was an FBI special agent. She worked violent crimes against kids. So it was like this weird intersection of dinner parties where we had to hear about the worst things you could ever imagine happening to kids everywhere. And 
also just this pull for me to be out in the woods and like starting to realize that this, you know, white picket fence lifestyle, it just wasn't for me. And those two things coming to a head and then ultimately, you know, she and I ended up getting divorced, you know, led me down this path of just, hey, all in, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to keep my high tech job, but move out to the woods. Yeah, that's a big, big catalyst. Yeah. So, so talk about how, how the, I mean, you were alluding to it, but talk a little bit about how the writing shifted and the things that you're into now. You've got Turning Feral, you've got a couple novels here, yeah. Bone Scraper series. Um, break those down, brother. Yeah, yeah, no. So Turning Feral is all about me doing exactly that. So after those first few years that I started to dabble in hunting, learning how to bow hunt, um, my ex-wife and I, we got a divorce and we had no kids. So I was at a crossroads. I had been to Idaho once in an off chance trip and I'd seen every game animal that I ever thought I could want to hunt, meaning elk, antelope, deer, wolf, bear, a whole lot. And so when that happened, I pointed the car north and I just drove to Boise and I got a month to month rental and I started looking at properties all over the state. Um, tried to close on one that was where Lewis and Clark first unfurled the flag west of the Rockies, but that fell through. And I ended up in a little town called Atlanta, Idaho. Um, it is, like I said, the most remote town in Lower 48. We're at the end of a 70-mile dirt road that's either usually in the winter avalanched in or rocks slid in in the summer. Um, there's no grocery store, no gas station. We have natural hot springs, a river that runs through town. And my back door of our cabin opens up to 3,000 acres of public land uh, where I began to cut my teeth on learning how the hell to live off grid failing miserably every single corner and learning to hunt and trap. So it was just this natural evolution after that catalytic or catalytic event of you know divorce. And then things just kind of snowballed from there, literally and figuratively. And what timeline, paint the picture of the timeline, because you, you know, 2020 was like a massive one, no matter what. <laughs> Jabbed or not jabbed, no matter where you sit, you know, like it was a fucking, it was a roller coaster ride for everyone on the entire planet. I think collectively, um, you know, the most important point in recent, in, in our, you know, in our lives, but certainly in, in recorded history, pot potentially, yeah. you know. 2019. So I was right before the pandemic. So it was, you know, everything was hunky dory in the U.S. Um, where we were living, things were going great. Um, the, the unexpected divorce happened. And then I went north and I had about eight months before the pandemic hit. So I had really just closed on the cabin maybe two or three months before the pandemic hit. And thankfully I was starting to date my now wife and mother of my children and had convinced her to drive four hours with no cell phone signal to check out this cabin in the middle of nowhere. And you know she obviously has very terrible judgment, but I don't hold that against her. And, uh, you know, well, really, it was such an interesting time to try to go off grid because, you know, up in Atlanta, where we were at, you would never have known the pandemic happened. You know, there were 38 people, you know, meeting aid was a little higher. So, you know, at some point you see a mask or two, but overall it was just nothingness. And then we had this really sharp contrast of going back into Boise, which is the nearest large town. And, you know, we'd come out after, you know, a couple months into the pandemic and, you know, we're like, all right, shit's going sideways. People are fighting over toilet paper. Let's make a grocery run. And you go in and it's just chaos. So it was a really interesting place to be right as the pandemic kicked off. But it was also one of the best places to be because, you know, largely we were unaffected and we rode it out the whole time up there. So it was a uh, time in the woods with nobody. Like people weren't really traveling up there that much. And it was just emptiness. And it was a great place for me to heal and, you know, start to grow a new family uh, during that time period. But it was interesting because I did not have the same experience that most people had during yeah, that sounds that sounds like the perfect place to be in. Did that spawn a lot of writing, having that much time to yourself in nature? Of course, yeah. So, you know, what happened with the, the Turning Feral book is, you know, I learned everything the hard way. So I was out trapping hard, which has kind of become my favorite thing, you know, even above hunting, which is trapping for fur, because we were trying to, A, get meat, 
through hunting and trapping, but also learn how to build our own furs and, you know, clothing if we ever needed to. Not that we uh, actively build, you know, buckskin jackets for our kids. We're not that, uh, not that crazy, I guess you could say, but, you know, knowing how to and, you know, how to turn things into leather for other um, items we might want to use around our little homestead. But the ability to focus all in on that aspect and learning those trades, especially you kind of just per, on the periphery where we're seeing the world go to shit. You're like, well, this is the best time to learn how to be really self-sufficient, right? Like, uh, you know, it doesn't matter that I'm learning it the hard way that I'm getting my hand caught in traps that I'm letting animals go or, you know, missing deer and elk and everything else. I felt like I had such a long runway because it looked like things were never going to turn back around. Um, so again, perfect place to just learn. And I had two years without much interference of anybody else to come in and, you know, just learn the hard way, which is something I do very well. <laughs> That's awesome. And so you got, you got this nice chunk of time, obviously, I think I was in the same boat. I, I don't remember who I was talking to about the fear. Fear was a big catalyst for me to want to homestead and do these things, having kids, you know, I was like, well, shit, man, the grocery stores could close. They may tell us if you don't have a fucking digital ID and a Vax pass, you can't come into the grocery store. Like all, all, all these timelines are available to us. And um, a lot of them I was looking at, I didn't like, you know, and so it, it, it did work out incredibly well um, for us to, to be on the property that we're on and, and be surrounded by the people and the team that we have. I mean, it's, it's, it couldn't have gone better. Yeah. But uh, fear, you know, I really, I really can thank fear for that, which is an odd thing to say, you know, like yeah. it's an odd thing to look back and be like, yeah, man, fear lift a, lit a fire into my ass. And that was a good thing. Yeah. And, and to the writing point, you know, I worked with Tucker on my book, Turning Feral. And, you know, we sat together and we were talking about personas and like, who are you writing to? So, you know, in this space where I'm up there trapping full time, hunting full time and thinking about who am I writing this book for? And it was, for my former self. And it was that reflection of now that I had kids, if I looked back on the Zach that was the white picket fence, you know, I thought I was tough, you know, doing jujitsu, ultra running, all these different things. But if you peeled back all the bullshit and you said, if everything shut down, the grid, um, grocery stores were shut, that person that I was writing to would have to admit to themselves that their kids would die. And that was a really hard thing for me to come to terms because I realized that for myself, you know, even if I hit a deer with my car, I wanted to know how to turn that into real food for my kids, right? I'd throw it on a fire and hope I could salvage something that would be edible for them and provide nutrients. But I didn't know how to garden. I didn't know anything. I was so reliant on everything, this whole ecosystem that has been built up in the US, which as amazing as it is, you know, it has bred this idea of reliance. And there's so many people I know, so many people that have either read the book or have reached out curious about it. They're like, I felt the same way. And that is now, you know, hopefully in a lot of cases, given people the nudge to say like, it's going to suck to learn, but you can go learn little bits and bobs. You can go to your local, local butcher or a local farm and, you know, see what the process is like to actually take an animal's life and turn it into food. Um, but it, that was the exercise overall in that space. You know, I had time to write and I wanted to write to other people who were just like me and let them know, like, you can learn. Like YouTube, everything else, there are resources out there that can make it easier than the way I learned, which was just, you know, hard-headedness in the woods. But it's available to you and your kids don't have to die if everything shuts down, if you take a little bit of a proactive stance. Yeah, I think one of the the big nudges for me was just that, like, how can I, what's the minimum effective dose for me to do to where I can sleep a little easier at night, especially regarding the kids, you know? And, and as it turns out, you know, Tucker said this, he's like, we could be completely wrong. All this shit could go smooth going forward. We may never have another world war. It may be just fucking turn out to be some type of weird utopia and, and we're completely wrong. And he's like, but would I, would I have any regrets about starting a, a biodynamic farm or teaching my kids survival skills, mm -hmm. getting them outdoors more? He's like, fuck no, absolutely not. You know, and I feel the same way. The benefit though, 
is in the act itself. You know, like you, I spend time doing jujitsu and I still go and spar in boxing, not with the thought that I'm going to get into a fight on the street. Mm-hmm. That's a, that's, I, I think I'm covered there with the fighting career, but, but it's not for that. It's because there's, there's something in the act itself that is fulfilling, right? I think anything we, when we talk about survival skills, homesteading, learning how to clean, you know, clean and kill your own animal. How do you preserve that animal? Do you know how to make pemmican? What are your recipes? Any of these things, you know, like all of that, there's something in that experience in itself that makes it awesome right now. Yeah. And then also is a nice, you know, if shit is the fan, like then it's going to be really important to know as well. Yeah. And it's weird because it was always viewed as the prepper community. Right. And it was always taboo and it's been awesome to see a little bit of that tabooness lifted from it. And it's just practicality. You know, we're all going back to the dirt at some point and realizing that and realizing that if you can work with what's available naturally, you could probably survive if everything else goes to shit, like you said. And and so many people's eyes are open to that now. And like you said, even just the act of it, the act of learning that never say die mentality of like, I'm never going to know it all, but I want to just continue to learn. Um, and there's so much like it, it is the ultimate overwhelming experience when you start to lift the rug around self-sustainability. You know, it, it makes you appreciate everything that our country has built over the last hundred plus years. Like it's amazing what all is available that you can go five minutes from your house to an HEB and you can get roasted green chilies and salsa and anything else you want ready-made. But like you said, that might not always be there. And that mentality has been shown to the whole world with the pandemic. And many people have already forgotten it, which is amazing to me. It is <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. it is total amnesia in a lot of regards, but I think a lot of people have really glommed on to the fact that Oh yeah, that was like a, a year ago that people were getting in fist fights over toilet paper. Yeah, I'm I'm going to be a little bit more forward thinking in how I move forward with my family, and that's where we're at. Not full on prepper, but man, we are trying to learn every little bit and bob to be self sufficient as we can be, and it's a test every day, and one that I fail more times than not. I, well, I'm curious, you know, with, with, with so much, and that's kind of the same boat I was in, even just from a farm standpoint, I was like, you got Rudolf Steiner's biodynamics. You've got all the greats, you know, in regenerative agriculture from savory and, and these different guys on animal rotation and plant animal husbandry. And then you've got, you know, Seth, Seth Holzer and these different folks, Richard Perkins, you know, big in the permaculture space. It's like, there's, it, you could, it's a PhD in each one of these little avenues. And there is some some overlay between them that was like, holy shit, I've got so much to learn so fucking quick, you know? And then, and it really was just letting my own North star, you know, where does my desire bring me to what do I want to learn next? Who am I going to learn it from? Can I share this with other people in the process? You know? And, and I think that's been, um, that's really been the only, only way that I've had a direction in any of this, because there's, you can go in all directions. Talk a bit about like when you, when you finally got your place in, in Idaho, Northern Idaho, was it just that? What did it, was it desire or was it like, oh, there's a community here that's into beaver pelts. Maybe I should learn that. Talk a little bit about your process and figuring out what to do first. Yeah, it was circumstance, definitely. Um, you know, w- when I came to Idaho post-divorce, as most men going through that can probably relate, I was going out with the mentality of, fuck everything. I'm going to be Jeremiah Johnson. I'm going to be a mountain man, you know, I wasn't looking for the next relationship. I had no kids. I had no ties. It was just, I'm going to go live in the woods. Um, How quickly that unraveled is amazing. Um, Mostly by just the sheer fact that to live somewhere where we live, so remote, like there does, there has to be a community aspect. And I quickly found that out in our little town of 38 people. And I talk a bit about it in the book, but I didn't even know how to keep a fire going in my wood burning stove. I didn't grow up with wood burning stoves. So I didn't realize the flue on my um, little wood burning fireplace was shut. So I kept trying to build these fires and it's like, you know, negative 14 degrees out. Fire kept dying in the middle of the night and I'd be so frustrated. I'd be jackhammering the floor cold with a blanket, trying to figure out how to keep a fire going all night, tending it. I'm like, well, this sucks. Like, 
how the hell did people used to do this, trying to like sit up and blow on a fire all night? Um, you know, lo and behold, it was a simple fix, but it took that kind of stripping away of my ego to eventually go ask a neighbor who came over and haughtily laughed at me for a little while, say, hey, dumb half <laughs> flu, fire needs oxygen, right? So if that gives any credence to the level I was working at, it was brand new. So, you know, it, it was that community building aspect that started to kind of decide where my interests went. And for us up in central Idaho, you know, we have a lot of fur bearing animals that are causing destruction. And a lot of the old time trappers that used to live in Atlanta, you know, were no longer trapping. So there was no balance to it. So they're like, Hey Zach, like, I know you're into hunting. You're trying to learn all this mountain man stuff. What about trapping? I'm like, well, you know, it was kind of in the back of my head, but not an interest. And mentors pulled me out and said, let me take you out. And they really seeded that to say, you know, beaver, which is my favorite thing to trap and hunt in the world is, you know, A, you can use the pelts for all sorts of really cool stuff. The meat is great. You know, the glands you can sell for a profit. And, you know, beaver is what the West was founded on, right? For the felt hats, for the glands and perfumes and food additives. Um, I mean, beaver castor oil was used in vanilla extract up until like 10 years ago, right? So it was just this ultimate resource, which interested me just from an academic perspective. And then it just spread from there. And, you know, now it's starting to take the path where you're at, where we've done the hunting, we've done the trapping, you know, I'm into the long range shooting now, but where we're at, it's like, okay, well, what about gardening and animal husbandry? And I'm just now kind of starting to scratch the surface of that. But um, it was community that led me on my path of you know, touching on these different PhD areas and seeing what worked for me and what didn't work for me. And, you know, now we're knocking on the door of the whole other you know, echelon of just craziness and complicatedness that just makes you feel like you're drowning at all points. But hopefully you come up with some sort of plant you can eat at the end of the day or yeah. you know, leverage. Yeah. Some stuff will do really well and some stuff's not going to do it. And that's just, that's just the nature of the beast. We did a whole we had Chad Johnson, who's a Sepholzer understudy, out and really figured out our food forest. He was the soul behind it. And uh, we did our first permaculture course with him. And we got totally screwed on soil. We bought a bunch of compost, you know, and, and most guys will say, like, if you squeeze the compost, it should form like a cat turd mm -hmm. and just, it just stay right there as a cat turd. Like it doesn't, it doesn't change, you know? And um, we built out this whole, you know, small market garden, but, it, but you know, we got, I think, 10 rows. Um, a food that we put in and nothing was grown. And we're like, what the hell's going on? So we went back to this extra stash we had of this really good compost we just bought and it was fucking dirt. And we were squeezing it and it was, there was, it was not clumping. It was falling through our hands like sand. And I was like, damn, dude, damn. Like this whole, that whole year's market garden is shit. So we started yeah. relocating stuff into our berms with the, where the food forest is. And thankfully we've had tomatoes and squashes take off because that is really good, healthy soil. Uh, but yeah, it's funny. Like there's something like that, or one of our sprinklers goes down, one, uh, a row of sprinklers goes down. We lost 50 trees our first year out of 400 just because a row went down and we didn't, we caught it too late in the summer and they were gone. Um, so there's, there's shit like that. You know, we, we brought all our sheep out, probably the only people in Texas that, that put a food source in the land without protection. Yeah. It's like, oh, we got game fence, you know, and lose six in one night to coyotes. We're like, oh no, oh no. All right. So it is hit the ground running and you, you learn the hard way, but it is pretty cool. Um, I mean, it's the, one of the most rewarding things on, on planet earth. The only way I can compare it is to actually having kids. Like you have kids like you're the food forest and even the animals require so much attention when they're new and they're young. And then at a certain point they're like teenagers they are like, fuck you, dad, I got this, you know, I'm cool now. I don't, I don't really need your help anymore and assistance, but getting it to that point, is like having a newborn and a toddler and all these different phases that he goes through. So, um, and then, yeah, incredibly rewarding. We had our first, this year we had our first peach that was, was ripened on the tree. Mm -hmm. Like all, all, any fruit you'd ever eat in a grocery store, it doesn't matter how organic, biodynamic, no matter what it is, it's always pulled early so it can ripen in the bag. So like letting it, let it vine ripe and letting it literally get ripe on the tree is going to have the most nutrient content. It also tastes a lot different. It was the yeah. first time I had to experience that at 41 years old. I was like, holy shit, there's something to this, you know? Isn't that such an eye-opening experience? You know, I, I, like you, got into stuff later in life. And, um, you know, my now wife's 
family, she's Russian, so they're emigres. They came over here, you know, right after the fall of the you know, Soviet Union. And they grew up with farms and they have a little place out in Nampa, Idaho, and they have fruit trees and everything else like that. And, you know, for our daughter to go and pick those things, buy and ripen. And, you know, she'll, at two years old, will call out the difference. She's like, this tastes better than like the peach we bought at the grocery store. Um, and, you know, I'm same as you. Like I grew up on store bought food. So like those, you don't know what you didn't miss. And then, you know, you're 41, I'm 36. It's, you think, what have I missed my whole life? And you almost feel like you have to play catch up a little bit to kind of get these things and make sure you at least give it to your kids. But it does make you curious. Like, what have we done? Like all this great infrastructure we built, like what the hell have we done? Yeah, there's a big, there's a, I mean, we're disconnected in so many ways. I think, you know, that just from, from the screen game, one yeah. thing I wanted to ask you about, you know, is that I've had, you know, James Schmachtenberger on his brothers with Daniel Schmachtenberger. They're a part of some pretty big think tanks that really focus on existential risk, you know, but there's not, they're kind of a jack of all trades and weighing the scales of different things and, and maybe not necessarily an ace in winning any one particular thing. Having spent as much time in AI as you have, where do you see that potentially? I mean, I read Nick Bostrom's book, Super Intelligence, you know, and he, he talks about a thousand different ways this can go awry, you know, but, but I, I think with somebody, you know, like yourself who spent so much time in the game, what do you, where do you see like, like real threads, you know, that are a little bit, maybe not as far out there as a, a what was it? A, a paperclip machine that ruins the world to make paperclips because it has no end function, you know? Um, maybe not that far-fetched, but just in learning what you know about the machine learning and the algorithms and how ads are set up and different things like that, the influence that it has on us, where do you see this as a problem in the near future and maybe the far future? Yeah, my kind of normal joke about this is there's a reason I live in a cabin at the end of an 80 mile dirt road, you know, <laughs> like being a little too much, I guess. I'm not as bullish as a lot of people, to be honest, right? Like it is, the math for artificial intelligence has been around since the 50s. We are just at an inflection point where the compute power, right? The actual physical hardware able to run large data sets through algorithms that have been thought of for years is coming to fruition. That's why you have things like ChatGPT, um, really booming the last year, you have the company NVIDIA who went from like a $1 billion market cap company to like $3 trillion or something like that in the last year because they build the chips and everything that power, you know, the ability to run these algorithms. So it, it's not like it's new things, right? It's just the application of them. Um, I am more bullish that you know, there will always be human interaction and intervention in a lot of these things, which will keep a little bit of the nefarious purposes away. But at the same time, there are people at the helm and some of those people, you know, want nefarious things. Like you see the ability and where I get concerned, right? The ability to target ads or, you know, news articles at vulnerable individuals who might not be able to discern what is or isn't a either a, a real piece of information or, you know, they just don't understand the concept of targeting, right? And are able to kind of let it go. And like, I have experience there. So I know when I'm getting certain ads for certain reasons, you know, people think, uh, oh yeah, I was talking about such and such yesterday and all of a sudden I got an ad for it today. It's not that things are listening to you. It's like your actual behavior across all your devices, everything you're interacting with, is being fed into some model somewhere for a company to be able to take an action and give you that well of a targeted ad. Um, and that's scary. I'm more worried about the kids and my kids and their interaction and limiting how their digital footprint is being used. And that's where, and I don't have an answer for this to you know, really answer. I'm just kind of opining here a little bit. It's these generations that are coming up where their digital footprint is being tracked constantly, whether your kids on YouTube kids or wherever, like there is a pattern being built there that some company that is funding that can use to then target them in a meaningful way for them, not necessarily for your kids. And you, know, you and I, we probably went, got a DSL connection in our twenties or something. Right. And it was, you know, the world was open and it was great, but 
even companies back then didn't know how to handle the data that was being produced. So you know, we largely don't have a big digital footprint, but now you have companies who are, you know, from the jump now know how to handle data, how to annotate it and hold it in a way that can actually feed into a machine learning algorithm meaningfully. And, and that's going to be detrimental for our kids and figuring out a way to limit that is vital. And I don't know how that happens. I don't know if it does happen. And that's what's scariest to me is the impact on the youth and how everything is just going to be a materialistic, you know, push for consumerism that is not necessary or meaningful. Have you have you uh, studied much on Steiner and Lucifer and Harman? So I am about two and a half hours into that podcast. So let's go, Paul Checks yeah. podcast. I'll link to that in the show notes. Yeah, well, it's funny. I uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to read that short story I sent back to. Um, if you do get a chance. I, I was like one page in and then had the kids come in on me while I was on the shitter, but I, I do want to pick it up. It looks really good. It, well, it's interesting because the whole idea like Aramon and, you know, like the, the technology aspect is, it seems so, again, you, you, you hear these things and you've, uh, you know, I grew up in a traditional Christian household. I kind of bucked the system. I went and studied Buddhism overseas. I studied Islam when I lived in Saudi Arabia, you know, trying to find my own path and kind of a circled back to, you know, Christianity and some of the elements and principles that are just aligned there fundamentally. But, you know, getting to learn something new, I hadn't known about Aramon, honestly. Um, and all of those practices and everything else, I hadn't heard of that. So it's interesting to see the alignment with some of these consumerism, technology-related roles that fit so well that line with that Lucifer and how, you know, the kind of guiding Christ principle underneath can help pull some of that back. But um, two and a half hours in, it's a little mind blowing. So I don't have an opinion. <laughs> it's one of those things that I, uh, I looked at my wife the other day, I went on a walk in the morning and was listening to it. And I came back, she's like, you look funny. I'm like, my head hurts. Um, in all the positive ways. Right. But it was, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't have a good answer for that. Well, no, that's just, I mean, it's, it is mind blowing. The, the, the level of what Steiner knew a hundred years ahead of time is utterly fucking mind blowing. Like, it's kind of like, is that real? Like, holy shit. Like this guy had this, it was that dialed in. I mean, he created Waldorf education. He created Biden and farming. He didn't create Biden and farming, but he brought it into the consciousness that was going on before. And he was able to really display, you know, these are the, these are the, the principles and practices that make something biodynamic, our relationship with nature. I mean, 118, he wrote on a hundred or lectured on 118 different topics and he had over 300 you know, books made from his lectures. I mean, it's, it's just remarkable. But yeah, we'll link to that in the show notes. It's five hours long. It's mind blowing, but it is, it's, it's completely in alignment, you know, with, with some of the fears of what we would have, you know, and I share those fears. Um, did you ever see the creepy line? It's a documentary on Google. No, I it's haven't. on, it's on Amazon prime, oddly enough, but it's a very good documentary. And it really just shows like, like Google from the inside out. And there's a lot of shit, you know, we know, um, from tracking and stuff like that. And there's a lot of stuff that will blow people's minds. Um, but it does kind of flow into that. You know, you hear like the heads of these companies basically saying like, we want to know you better than you so we can deliver you the best product. And it seems cool on paper, you know, and then you're like, well, imagine growing up in that. What discernment would you have if things are like, I mean, they're already easier to get, you know, like I want to teach, teach my kid how to hunt. I want to teach him how to, how to he's wit. He sat on my lap, bear sat on my lap when he was four at a bison harvest at Rome Ranch. And that was a powerful moment for him. And we got to pray over the animal and thank the animal. And and every time we ate that animal, he knew exactly where it came from and he knew what it took to bring that animal to us. Um, but that's that's a disconnect. There's so many things that we get disconnected from, you know? And so you think about that, like and then when it's just handed to us, like you're talking hand pans or whatever the thing is, you know? And it shows them like, oh, that's cool. This thing coincidentally just showed up in my feed. You know, I've really been thinking about it a lot lately. So I bought one, you know, like there's, I hope that they have the discernment that's necessary to be able to know when they can unplug, when they can't. I think that's a part of our job as parents is to make sure that they, they have balance in that, right? The Christ principle, the middle way, they have balance to disconnect and, and, and the softness to meditate, just to let everything clear and, and come to a stillness point so that they can have more intelligence, more of their innate 
ability to intuit what's happening and, and are they being influenced in different directions? If so, how, and what does that middle path actually look like? Yeah, I think finding that out is so vital um, because otherwise it goes the other direction. And, you know, spoiler alert for that short story, I said, you, you should link this in the show notes too. It's- 100%. Um, E.M. Forrester, and he wrote it in 1909. It's called The Machine Stops. And, you know, again, foreshadowing perfectly similar to Steiner. And the story is a depiction of the future, you know, where we're at today. But everybody is retreated underground. Everybody is provided for by the machine. Everybody has their own room. You give birth, your kid gets another room somewhere else on earth where it's allotted for them. And, you know, all they do is higher education. So they, all they do is lectures and philosophy. They don't touch the earth. You know, they're fed through tubes and they think and have been taught now that the earth above them is, you know, that's for the wild man. Nobody wants that. Uh, and naturally a son starts to talk to his mother and he starts to have these questioning thoughts and the mother starts to get concerned and she gets so frustrated that she has to fly from her pod, which is somewhere in like New Delhi all the way over to wherever he's at, which would be like present day Argentina. And she's flying in this earth ship. So he like predicted air travel and you know, they've been FaceTiming through like their screens, predicted that, but she's flying and the whole story is about her looking down at like the Himalayas and the earth where she's just like, that's so disgusting. Like why, you know, why would anybody ever want that? Goes and see her, their son and her son's like, mom, there's more to this. Like I want to go to the surface. And she's like crazy, whatever. Let's them go. Um, the rest of the story is the sun kind of getting to the surface and, you know, being taught that, you know, air is bad, but, you know, the system under the earth starts to shake and, you know, people start dying in their pods and this guy gets up and realizes there's other people who had escaped and, you know, we're living back in an Eden of sorts of saying, like, we're back to earth. Like, that was all a lie. It was all a facade to, you know, satiate people and just have a machine run in it pretty amazing and telling like between him and Steiner and, you know, we're living it now, which is what's scary. And I think having that wherewithal, you know, it's so easy to look and say, okay, I'm being a little bit over dramatic. Look at everything we have. It's so easy to be satiated and, you know, just fall back on those old habits. But again, building those little skills along the way, I think will go so far because we're living that reality now between Lucifer, Aramon, the Christ principle, and everything else that tech is pushing on us, it's it's hard to not need to go and learn these different aspects that you're learning, I'm learning, other people in our social groups are learning. And wish for the best. 